History is all around us. There are secrets of our past around every corner, hidden in our street names, buried under our feet. And in this series, I'm going to be uncovering these secrets by exploring Britain's most historic towns. This is the original Roman. And I want to discover which towns across the UK can claim to reveal the most about each period in British history. <laughs> it is terrifying. I'll be deciphering clues in familiar landscapes, bringing lost landmarks back to life and peeling away the layers to reveal a unique view of these towns in all their former glory. Oh, look at this, look at this. From the Vikings to the Victorians, the Romans to the Tudors, I'll reveal the story of an era through the story of a single town. This week, I'm taking a giant leap back in time to visit Britain's most Viking town. The Vikings had a reputation for being fearsome and ruthless warriors. Oh, who hell? But they were so much more. Look at that. Enormous ring of silver. I'm heading to a place that was the site of one of the biggest and most important archaeological discoveries in Britain. It is unique, isn't it? A whole new sort of concept of the Vikings. Where the locals aren't shy about celebrating their Viking past. Altur! <laughs> and which is home to a rare artefact hailed as more precious than the crown jewels. Now, this is an extremely important and beautiful object. Yes, if you really want to understand the Vikings, York is the place to be. Today, visitors flock to the walled city of York to walk its cobbled streets and enjoy its historic architecture. But long before York's famous cathedral, the Minster, and the quaint tea rooms appeared here, the town was home to some of history's most terrifying invaders. think of the Vikings in Britain, then York does certainly spring to mind. But of course, there were other invaders here. The Romans, the Anglo-Saxons, and eventually the Normans too. But it was the Vikings that seemed to have left the biggest impression on this city. And I want to find out why. Vikings from Scandinavia crossed the sea to raid undefended monasteries in Ireland, Scotland and England in the late 8th and early 9th centuries, returning home with their booty. But by the middle of the 9th century, they'd begun to stay in England over winter. And in 865 AD, they assembled a great army capable of conquest. They were intent on establishing a permanent presence in England. They chose York as their base, capturing the town in 866. They would rule in York for nearly a hundred years, and the legacy of York's Viking past is still clearly visible in the city today. As you walk around York, so many of the road names end in gate, and that is Viking, that's Old Norse. Gatter means street. So there's Hungate, the street of the dogs, there's Swinegate, the street of the pigs, there's Coppergate, the street of the cupmakers, and then there's Whitmer Whatmergate, and I have no idea what that is. But these reminders of York's Viking past are something of an oddity. The Vikings left almost no written records of their time in this country, which can make telling their story in Britain a challenging task. And it also means that we get a rather one-sided view of them, penned by their enemies, who were keen to portray them as violent, bloodthirsty pagans. But although it's not strictly history as we understand it, there are traces of their exploits to be found in the famous Viking sagas, tales told verbally and passed down from generation to generation. And some of the sagas are still being recounted today. Bye. 
is a thriving Viking metal scene here in York. Well, I love the Vikings. I'm not averse to a bit of metal. Let's go and have a Weird staff are singing one of the ancient sagas in original Old Norse whilst giving the story a distinctly modern twist. It was a rendition of Hedoran's song from Egil's Saga. I think it's great. I think it's fantastic that you're getting inspiration from these ancient traditions and you are wearing Thor's hammer. <laughs> so, so you're obviously a fan of the Vikings. It's got to be done. My Old Norse is a bit rusty, so I've asked Viking expert Matt Townen to translate. So, Matt, what was that about? They were singing uh, the words of a Viking Age poem, um, a poem from Viking Age York, uh, composed in honour of the last Viking King of York, Eric Bloodaxe. So what does it actually mean, this poem? What does it, what does it tell us? Uh, the, the main part of the poem is, is a praise of the king. It presents Eric Bloodaxe in a series of heroic postures. I'll just read it. Thar vas egya at ok odda gnat, od stir of gat, erica at that. So there was thrusting of edges and clash of spears. Eric gained fame from that. And this was entertainment. These are signs of a good day's work by yeah. the Viking Age king. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not, that's not an outsider saying that they're, they're barbarians and they're warlike. They're saying it's we are warlike yeah. and we're proud of so, it. So the Vikings have got this, this stereotype, this product identity, we might say, but as you say, that sort of image of the Vikings that we're so familiar with actually does go back to the Viking Age itself. So at this point in their history, the Vikings seem pretty keen to portray themselves as legendarily bloodthirsty warriors. But why do they decide to settle in England and choose York as their base? Our aerial archaeologist Ben Robinson is searching for clues in the landscape. The first Viking raids concentrated on the coastal communities, the easy pickings. But York was a target that was vital to the Vikings when they got more adventurous. York was established at the points where the River Ouse and the River Foss meet. Now, the Romans saw the strategic importance of that location and they put a legionary fortress there. The Vikings saw exactly the same thing. York was already a successful town, a trading centre. It was a prize they just had to have. There was another obvious advantage in York's geographical position for the Vikings as well. It was close to their Scandinavian homeland and easily accessible from the sea via the River Humber and the Ouse. I'm beginning to think the Vikings really were opportunists. Here is this ready-made town on this wedge of land between the Ouse and the Foss. And it was a fortified town in Roman times, added to over the centuries by the Anglo-Saxons. And if you leave the Viking homeland in Denmark, sail across the North Sea and come over to England, then you can simply go up the Humber, turn right up the Ouse, and eventually you arrive here in York. But there was a sticking point. York was an important Anglo-Saxon town, a trading hub and a centre of political power. And the locals were not going to give it up without a fight. It is really easy to distill history down into these short, quite trite sentences. The Vikings took York. Well. What was that like for the people living here? How much of a conflict was it? 
And how do the Vikings manage it anyway? Do they have superior weaponry? Were their tactics better than the Anglo-Saxons? Or was it just about sheer numbers? Well, I can think of no one better to talk to you about all of this than Gareth Williams. And he's in here with a load of swords. Gareth. Hi, Alice. Good Hello. to see you. Wow, you have got a lot of weapons with you. Nice to see you. And you. Now, how different are these weapons from the weapons that the Anglo-Saxons would have had? Very, very similar. Almost all the weapons that you see here were basically shared. The one weapon that does differ is this, a large axe. This is something which is typically Viking. Put the helmet on. OK. Oh, that's heavy. I'm glad to see it's got felt inside. Let's sh start with how you hold a shield. The shield has a single handle behind this metal boss. Yeah. So that is the best bit of protection that you've got. It's not just a static defence. And so you want to use it more dynamically, use it sweeping aside rather than just leaving the shield there to be hit. Uh, let's give you a weapon to go with your shields. So an axe like this, it's a pretty fearsome weapon. So <laughs> I'm pulling it for your safety. And there's a big swing, I can change direction with that. I can hook round your shield and pull it out of the way <laughs> no. and then come in again. Oh, hell. This is really you, you scary. You wouldn't want to have to defend yourself against this yeah. for real. It's, it's a big mass coming towards you. It, it is, and a lot of this is about intimidation. It's about scaring the other person. And you can do that in any number of ways. And there's more. <laughs> Gareth has invited along some Viking reenactors to demonstrate another highly effective tactic. We've got a number of Vikings here, and they're going to show us the shield wall. And this is really the only tactic that is described in contemporary sources. <laughs> so, as you can see, it's a pretty solid wall of shields here. And you try pushing against any one of those, you're pushing against not just the weight of that shield and the person behind it, but the one next to it, and so on. Yeah. They're all reinforcing each other. But this is where the shorter weapons are quite effective. So I can't get close to, to them. They're standing there solidly, very hard to break through that. You're just going to charge them. You've got to break them in one go or take the consequences. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm retreating. Armed to the teeth with their swords and their axes, the Vikings would make York their own. But the Anglo-Saxons weren't about to give up that easily. How many times did York change hands then between the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons? There's toing and froing for a number of years. But what's interesting about that period of constant chopping and changing between Anglo-Saxon rulers from the south and these Viking rulers of Northumbria is that a large part of the Northumbrian people and even the archbishops of York seem to have preferred independence under a Viking ruler to being just sucked into a, a larger single kingdom of England being ruled from the south. They didn't want ruling by some southern Ponzi king. In the final decades of the 9th century, a precarious truce was agreed between the Anglo-Saxon South and the Viking North, which would later become known as the Danelaw. At the centre of this new Viking territory was York, or Jorvik, as they named it. I'm in York, the perfect place to understand England under the Vikings. I've already looked for clues to the ferocity of the Viking invasion, but what was life like in the towns of Viking England once the bloodshed was over? While written information is scant, we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to physical traces of everyday life in the town. And that's thanks to one extraordinary archaeological dig in the centre of York. 
In 1976, right here at numbers 16 to 22 Coppergate, archaeologists began to uncover the best preserved Viking settlement found anywhere in the UK. The dig would eventually expand to take in over 10,000 square feet. And over the next five years, 40,000 artifacts would be unearthed, including five tons of animal bones, a quarter of a million pieces of pottery, and the most complete Viking era structures in the UK, four entire buildings miraculously preserved. From all these finds, archaeologists would be able to work out precisely what the Viking settlement here would have looked like. I've come to a Viking village evoking the atmosphere of Coppergate to see a few of the original thousand-year-old artefacts that the archaeologists unearthed. Ah, real live Vikings. Elsa Mainman is a leading expert on Coppergate. Hello. Hi. Have you brought finds from the Coppergate excavation? Yes, this is just a very, very small part of some of the things that were found. One of the items is this bone skate made out of a horse metatarsal. And we know that it's been fashioned. You can see it's sort of been cut with a knife to shape yeah. it, rather. But the bottom is the bit that really gives the oh, game yes. away. You can see yeah. how smooth that is. Because the river in York would have been wider and shallower, and it would have been tidal um, in the Viking times. And so this was probably a good way of getting across a frozen mm. river. That's fantastic. Skating Vikings. We also see evidence for trade going on. These bits and pieces have come from Scandinavia, showing the sort of continuing links with the homeland a nice little bit of a amber ring. We know that they were making those things. They didn't come from Scandinavia. They're actually producing them on the site. And we've got to know that because of the bits of raw amber. Trading the raw amber, that's coming in. Making into finger yeah. rings, pendants, a whole range of objects. It wasn't all trade and craft that you were finding evidence of. It was, it was people having fun as well. Yes, we did find things like gaming boards, a game of Nefertafel. Uh, we found actually part of the board, which was extraordinary. Again, a wooden board that had survived. And the playing pieces made out of chalk or bits of stone. So That's we amazing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so it, we get a little glimpse of, of how they spent their pastime. It is unique, isn't it, in, in Britain? We, do, we just don't have this this level of evidence from yes. anywhere else no. of, the, of the Viking Age and of people living and working and um, trading and crafting. It mm. does at least give people an insight into what you can find and what you can gain from, from this sort of research. Yeah. A whole yeah. new sort of concept of the Vikings as, as ordinary people doing ordinary tasks. that are going on all around me in this recreated Viking village have been informed and inspired by these incredible finds from Coppergate. And that excavation itself was like a time capsule providing us with the most complete picture of Viking life that we've seen anywhere in Britain. The record of everyday life preserved by these artefacts is just incredible from skating to board games to the extent of trade going on in 10th century Jorvik. Goods and people, including slaves, were pouring in and out. Jorvik would have been a bustling, busy, cosmopolitan town, and there's still something of that preserved today, as aerial archaeologist Ben Robinson can see from the skies. From up here, I can see the complete layout of the historic core. There's the town walls encircling the whole of the centre of medieval York. All these winding little streets in the centre here, all with their evocative Viking names. You just look down on the Coppergate area. Clusters of houses and shops and businesses. It does give some sense of what it was like in Viking times. Everything crowded together, everything going on in a, in a very small, confined space. 
you keep animals, pigs in the backyard, you slaughter your animals there. There's noise, there's mess, there's smell, there's manufacturing going on, there's a, there's a hubbub down there. For the Vikings, York was an unusual and successful experiment in urban living. As well as houses and workshops, the town had rudimentary sanitation in the form of very basic outside loos. And I know for a fact there's one infamous artefact in the Jorvik Viking Centre that preserves a lot of detail about everyday life here a thousand years ago. Oh, this is fantastic. So these are the new galleries in the Jorvik Centre. All these wonderful finds from the Coppergate excavations and such a range. Look at those shoes over there. Fantastic. We're getting very close to the lives of individual people. But I want to get even closer to one individual and one specific moment in their life. And this is a really famous find. Christine. <laughs> hello, hey, hello, hello. Nice hello. Nice to meet you. So this is, um, this is a find. Do people gravitate towards this oh, find? Oh, they do indeed. They do indeed. Particularly the children, I have to say. Do they? So let's just take out the case. I can kind of excuse myself, um, perhaps an unhealthy fascination with this, because I did used to be a medical doctor. I can take it out, yes, can I, Christine? Yeah. And I lift this out very carefully. Now, this is an extremely important and beautiful object. This is a Viking poo. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, first of all, it's amazing that it's a Viking poo and it survived in all its glory. Most of the faecal matter at Coppergate was all kind of mixed together in cesspits. But this poo, this rose from the ashes or rose from the sludge of Coppergate, completely pristine after a thousand years. And it's quite important because it means we can have a look at it and we can tell something about the parasites that Vikings had living in their guts, the intestinal worms. There are at least two varieties of parasitic worms in here. And we can also tell something about the diet. Very high fibre diet. You can kind of get that from the size of it as well. I mean, that is an eye-wateringly large poo, isn't it? And I imagine if we were still able to get DNA out of it, we might even be able to tell what Viking gut flora was like. So don't overlook poo on excavations. They can be extremely informative. Sanitation may have been somewhat lacking in Viking towns by modern standards, but on the other hand, we've got evidence that Viking men took good care of themselves, as some extraordinary finds from Coppergate have revealed. Steve! Hi, nice hi. To meet you. you brought cakes. Hey. How wonderful. Almost. <laughs> <laughs> Can I open the door? Okay. Dr. Steve Ashby is an archaeologist and Viking expert. What's in the box, Steve? We've got a lot of things in here, and particularly combs and comb making waste from York. This is quite a nice one from Coppergate. Oh, that's gorgeous. And this is broken, so it looks like it would have been symmetrical. And it's made of antler? It's made of antler, yeah. Antler is the most common material for this. And very typical of the kind that we see in York, um, which kind of clearly sort of shows the shape of the antler that it's cut from. And you can see quite clearly how it's constructed with all those separate pieces and then the rivets going through and holding them all together. And are they normally decorated like this? Very frequently, yes. Yeah. So we have a combination of these sort of um, crisscross lines. Sometimes we get um, ring and dot. Sometimes we get very complex interlace. It's a kind of quite a sort of distinctive repertoire of motifs that they use in lots of different ways. It's much more beautiful than any combs that I own, I must say. <laughs> OK, so who would these combs have been for, then? The only way to really know that is to look at graves. There are sites in Scandinavia which we think are associated with the military, so sort of garrison sites, mm. and they seem to have a particular sort of comb uh, that come with a case. So you can imagine men wearing combs in a little bone or antler case hung on their belt. So Viking men were quite concerned about their appearance then? Yeah, they? absolutely. And this may have created a particular problem in York. Scandinavian men are um, treating their hair in a particular way, they're bathing regularly, they're dressing nicely, and it's undermining uh, the virtue of Anglo-Saxon women, e including women of high status. Um. Uh, and that's seen as a major problem. So Anglo-Saxon women uh, were particularly susceptible then to the long-haired Vikings. It seems that way, yeah. it seems that way. Russ. Hello. Hi. 
Right. Thank you so much for coming along. We've invited Ross Taylor, a committed Viking reenactor, to meet us here for a makeover. So this is a replica of a Viking comb, mm -hmm. um, so quite similar to the ones that were found here in York at Coppergate. Yeah. That's pretty good. It's doing the job. Absolutely. Yeah. I think your beard's already looking more Viking-like. <laughs> Just after a few combs through with the Viking game. <laughs> good. What can we do to his hair? We could maybe braid it a bit. What kind of braids? There's some suggestions from sculpture and illustrations that are sort of knots and plaits in hair, but they're yeah. kind of... they're stylized, so it's, it's anyone's guess, really. We want to see for ourselves if a well-groomed Viking can still cause a stir on the streets of York. Are you nervous, Russ? <laughs> right then, Ross, let's see what the women of York think of you. Yes, why not? Lock up your Anglo-Saxon women. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do Vikings wait for green men, or do we just... I don't think, I think, no, I we think just, we're we just okay. walk out. I think yes. they'll stop. Good evening. <laughs> Odin! <laughs> Altur! Evening. I'm not sure the magic still works in the 21st century. Evening. <laughs> but the pride Viking men took in their appearance back then apparently had an effect on local men as well as women. One Anglo-Saxon monk complained that the men of York were copying the bathing habits and hairstyles of the pagan invaders. on the trail of the Vikings, and we've already discovered that there's an embarrassment of archaeological riches under the streets of this town that show that York was not only Britain's most Viking town, but a thriving commercial centre. Now, this burgeoning trade demanded innovations in shipbuilding, and I want to find out more. I've come to this slipway on the River Ouse to meet Viking boat owner Russ Scott and his wife Liz. Hello, nice to meet you. And is this your boat? It is, yes. And are you, what are you doing, repairing her? I'm just making some uh, bits of wood just to fill a few holes in. Yeah. <laughs> There's quite a few holes. <laughs> so, and you're a carpenter as well? Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. With a boat, you have to be master of lots of trades. Sail, woodwork, metalwork. So, Ross, was there something different about Viking shipbuilding compared with the ships that had gone before? I mean, obviously there were people crossing the North Sea before the Vikings, but were Indeed. they doing something different? They had configured the vessel with a new type of keel. Early vessels always had a flat keel. I can demonstrate this with my sword. Flat keels tend to sag and they tend to hog, and ultimately they'll break up. So you can only ever have a short vessel. This is why the Greek and Roman warships were very short, but went up in stages. Maybe okay for the Mediterranean, but not for the North Sea. North Sea, rough place to be. You have to reconfigure your vessel. You have to come up with a design that will work better in the North Sea. So what they did is they turned the keel essentially right angles and made a blade keel. Yeah. Not like a modern yacht blade keel. It's a short blade keel, but still it won't bend. You can press it and press it, it won't bend. It'll bend to the sides, of course, but that works in your favour as well because you build the strakes out, strips of wood, that's these things here. They actually form the sides of the yep. boat. Yeah. Build them out in a bow and you can soon see how this lovely bow-shaped yeah, vessel yeah. emerges. Right then, well, I'm looking forward to getting out on the river. Russ's boat is a lot smaller than the ships in which the Vikings would have sailed across the North Sea but it is typical of the type of boat they would have used once they'd settled in York for travelling up rivers like this. But during the 10th century, the larger Viking ships start to become more specialised. Some become longer and thinner as personnel carriers, the classic Viking longship. But others are shorter and wider for carrying cargo, the Nar. 
at around 50 feet long and 15 feet wide, a typical NAR can hold over 20 tonnes of cargo. The Viking trading empire expanded. More ships sailed to distant destinations like Constantinople. And ships also made long voyages across the North Atlantic to Viking settlements in Greenland and Iceland. York was well connected to the rest of the Viking world by river and by sea. Just how rich that trade would make the Vikings here was revealed in 2007 when a father and son made an extraordinary discovery in a field. I'm heading off now to Harrogate, which is where two metal detectorists made this discovery 10 years ago. And I can't tell you the precise find spot because it is an extremely well-guarded secret and I'm not going to be the one that spills the beans. The lucky detectorists were David and Andrew Whelan. Tell me about that day. Tell me what happened. Well, it was just a Saturday morning. We were driving around a couple of farms that we had permission on. Yeah. Um, just thinking of somewhere to go, really, for a couple of hours. We were only there 10 minutes, were we? Not, <laughs> yeah, not <laughs> long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what happened? Well, we sort of wandered off in different directions, <laughs> yeah. didn't we? You yeah. wandered yeah. off towards a bit of a hillside and you went down about 30 yards away. Yeah. And I got yeah. the bulls and started digging bits of lead up. Yeah. What did you think it was? Well, an old I thought an old cistern I'd found with a right. ball cock in it at the end. I thought, that's it, until I looked carefully. Oh, there was something roundish then? Well, that's... Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, the, the that's because it was like a round ball. Yeah, wasn't it was it? just a, a ball of mud when it came out. Yeah. Know. So what did you do? Well, we sort of panicked a bit. And we packed it all into yeah. a carrier bag. Yeah. And we? then, well, and then <laughs> ice cream tub. Yeah. Wasn't it? Yeah, I think, I can, I think yeah. that was our sandwich box for the day, wasn't yeah. it? What David and Andrew had discovered turned out to be one of the most important Viking finds in Britain. As well as the silver cup, there were over 600 coins and 67 other items, including exquisite jewellery. It became known as the Vale of York Hoard. I've arranged to meet Dr Andy Woods from the York Museums Trust to see some of the hoard items in all their scrubbed-up glory. We've got a few of the star pieces here. As you might imagine, not quite everything fits inside this box with some of the really great pieces. So then, should we start with the big pieces? Oh, go on. Do you want to do the honours or shall I? Um, can I? Yeah, That'd so if you can just lift Thank this you. one out here. So just put my fingers underneath it. Yes, Ooh, that's, that's it. quite heavy. Yes, it's a weighty piece of silver. Lovely. And then it's just wrapped up. Look at that. Yes, That's it's really heavy. Yes, it's one of the heaviest bits in the hoard, actually. Enormous ring of silver. That's wearing quite a lot of your wealth on your wrist. Yeah, it's a, it's a Viking status symbol. And this one here is much finer. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. twisted silver. A similar sort of size, but nowhere near as much silver, but much more decorative. Yeah, you know, really yeah. fine craftsmanship has gone into that. And just twisted around at the end there. Yeah, so just so... Kind of clasped together. Yeah, very simple, really. I know it's not as heavy and it's not worth as much, but I prefer this one, I'd wear that. <laughs> it's definitely the bracelets that catch my eye, but in fact it's the coins that tell more of a story. And one coin tells us not only when the hoard was buried, but perhaps even why. In the hoard, most of the coins are actually made in southern England. And this is a coin of King Athelstan. E-D-E-L-S-T-A-N and then he gets his rex afterwards, Athelstan rex. He's ruler of much of Anglo-Saxon England, sort of the south of York. He conquers York, uniting England in 927, and that's probably around about the time that this hoard was buried in the ground. Do you think this is a Viking quickly burying his treasure in the ground before the Saxons arrive to beat them out of York again? 
Yeah, absolutely. This would, and it couldn't just be any old Viking, because this is a huge fortune in the Viking mm. Age. So this is someone at the very top of Viking society, really elite in Viking York, taking their treasure, really, putting it in the ground. This endless tussle between the Saxons and the Vikings for York. With York constantly being fought over and changing hands, the Vikings knew they had to win the battle for hearts and minds if they wanted to keep the town. One coin that was minted right here in York shows how Viking identities, or at least their religious beliefs, may have been evolving. The most local coin of all of them that I'll show you is this one here. Through the middle, you've got a sword, yeah, and then the legend reads Sancti Petri Mo, or the money of St. Peter right. in Latin. Okay. Um, but that little symbol at the bottom is a hammer. Um, and that's a Thor's it's hammer. It's a Thor's hammer. So, so it's really mixing up Christianity and pagan ideas there. Yeah, absolutely. Deliberate mixing of Old Norse religion and then Christian symbolism on one coin. And it, it could only have been made here in York where you've got that mixture of Christians and um, incoming Vikings who have a variety of different beliefs. Now, how meaningful is all of this? Does this mean that they are blending together their pagan religion with Christianity? Or is it simply that this is what you expect to find on a coin? I think it's definitely deliberate. The reason for that is this looks quite unlike almost anything that has happened before. I think it's very much about the kings trying to appeal to as many different people as possible. Um, coins are the best bit of propaganda available to Viking kings. Mm. You know, they are struck in their millions, the most widely used objects um, that kings control. So it's very careful thought, very careful um, imagery used on these coins to try and appeal to their citizens. That's interesting, isn't it? Because, because if that's right, and what this coin is saying is, this is a multicultural society, but what we want is social cohesion. Yeah, absolutely. It's multiculturalism a thousand years ago. Oh, I loved getting the chance to see the hoard up close like that. I think of all of the objects in it, it was that little coin of St Peter that really grabbed me. That is the most curious, the most intriguing, the most exciting bit of evidence, because what it shows us is that you've got these two different ideas, these two different cultures coming together, the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons, and it's the very earliest evidence that we have of that synthesis. I'm in York, the perfect place to understand Viking England. The world's famous Coppergate dig has painted a detailed picture of the Viking town, and the treasures of the Vale of York hoard suggest a willingness by the Vikings to compromise and even embrace local customs and beliefs. The Vikings left an indelible mark on York in its street names, but actually it goes much further than that. So none of these buildings, of course, are original Viking, but the plan is five to six metre wide plots. And this meant that the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons were living crammed in, cheek by jowl. Surely they must have tried to get along. From the air, Ben is looking to see if there's more evidence of this peaceful cohabitation in the towns and villages surrounding York. As we're navigating round, I've got a sense of how densely settled this area was by Vikings, just from the place names that we're seeing all around us, the characteristic B-sounding names. So we've got Weatherby, Selby, Haxby, and then there's Thwaite, which is clearing, and then we've got Kirks, which means that there was a church there. The really interesting thing, though, is that we've also got Anglo-Saxon names as well as Viking names right alongside. So Elvington, Pocklington, Sutton, the Tun is farmstead or settlement, but in Anglo-Saxon. Now, if the Vikings wanted to wipe the Anglo-Saxons off the face of the earth, remove them from this area, surely they'd have changed all the place names. The Vikings seem to be getting more subtle. It's not about slaughtering, it's about intermingling, it's about getting along, it's about us and them against the others. This interaction between the Viking settlers and their English neighbours 
helped to create a unique melting pot of two cultures. But this was also a deeply religious age, when the church wielded great power. Perhaps the pagan Vikings were realizing that they needed to ally themselves with that power base. So I've come to York Minster because this cathedral contains a strange and wonderful object which tells us more about Vikings and the church. I've been given very special permission to see this precious artifact up close. And I'm meeting Dr. Alex McLean to find out more about it. Well, we have an amazing artifact of Viking York here in the Minster, which we're gonna come see. And are we actually getting it out? We are. Usually it's behind glass, so this is really kind of a special occasion to be able to get it out and actually handle it. Yeah. Oh, we can touch it. Yeah, yeah. <gasps> I can't wait to see it. This is the crypt, and here is the Horn of Ulf. A beautiful object. So, I mean, tell me what this is and where it comes from. So what we have here is a horn, a drinking horn or a calling horn made from a, a whole elephant tusk and it belonged to a Viking nobleman called Ulf. He was a major landholder in Yorkshire. So how does he come by such an exotic item? We're not entirely sure. What it shows, I think, is that the links of trade uh, that Viking York had to the highest elite objects uh, throughout Europe. And so when he gives it to the minister, uh, that's an incredible sort of symbol of his devotion to the Minster, um, yeah. that, that he would give them such a fine object as this. Can I hold it? Of course. Oh, it's really beautiful, isn't it? So we've got some extraordinary beasts there, like lions and deer, and then that looks like a griffin. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. So why is a pagan Viking giving this extraordinary gift to the church? Because he's not a pagan. By this point, um, Christianity is very widespread. And that's what this is. This is a symbol of a land grant to the minster by Ulf. Oh, um, I see. So, so it's he, not just the not just this. Not that just the giving. object. No, this is a, this is a symbol of a much more expensive grant uh, that he gives to to the minster, which is an enormous amount of land in Yorkshire. Um, and so uh, he gives uh, that land to the minster and the horn as a symbol that they now hold the tenure. So it's almost like a deed in yeah. material form. So this would be a way for the minster to kind of prove that it held that land uh, in, a, in an era before everything was necessarily fully documented. So do you think this conversion to Christianity is, is symptomatic of what's happening more broadly in society, that there's actually a blending of the Scandinavian with the Anglo-Saxon? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very much a part of the overall amalgamation of the two cultures, of the Scandinavian and the Anglo-Saxon cultures. And it's not a, simply an assimilation which the Viking culture sort of disappears into the existing Anglo-Saxon English culture, um, but it's very much a mixture of the two. And is it still there today? Is it still an important part of identity in Yorkshire? Uh, I think people in York know about the, the Viking heritage of the city, and I'm sure there's a, a pride of that. Whether they still consider themselves a bit Viking, I'm not so sure. I've met some that do. <laughs> In 954, the Viking Kingdom of Northumbria, with York as its capital, became absorbed into England. Six years later, a Viking King Canute would rule all England, but his dynasty quickly died out. And in 1066, the Viking era was truly over when the Normans arrived, led by William the Conqueror. The Vikings ruled in York for less than a hundred years, but their influence was so strong, it's still apparent today. The buildings have long gone, but there's still so much of the Vikings here in York, from the street names to local culture, gotta love a bit of Viking metal, to the treasures of York Minster. But it really is that extraordinary excavation at Coppergate that seals York's claim. That archeological dig gave us such a vivid glimpse of the ordinary lives of people during the Viking era. 
the Vikings make York their stronghold in England. Under their occupation, it grows into a thriving and industrious town. They design cutting-edge cargo ships that could cross seas and reach exotic ports. At the height of the Viking Age, York is a town of more than 10,000 citizens, confidently trading with the outside world. There's no question in my mind that York is Britain's most Viking town. <laughs>